Amen. You may be seated. So we're coming to the second in our series, the Missionary Jesus series, and today we're going to get a master class in sowing seed given by Jesus himself, and the story that we're going to study this morning comes from the third chapter of John. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what goes on in that story. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do the miracles thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. Nicodemus answered and saith, uh, <laughs> How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered and said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man, be born of water and the Spirit, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of spirit is spirit. Now, I don't know what Nicodemus might have been feeling at this particular moment, but there's something you should know about Nicodemus. He was a Pharisee. Pharisees were guys that figured the way to get to heaven was to follow scrupulously 613 laws. And that's what Nicodemus had devoted his entire life to. Now, God had just said to him, um, yeah, here's the thing, though. You have to be born again or you can't go to heaven. What was he feeling? Well, I think we find out by what Jesus says next, which is, marvel not. Now, I'm not a Greek scholar, but I have to think that maybe loosely translated from the Greek, that might mean, hey, Nicodemus, your mouth is hanging open, my friend. Marvel not that I say unto thee that ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not ten, tell whence it cometh or whither it goeth. So is with everyone born of the Spirit. Poor Nicodemus. The next thing he says is, <laughs> How can these things be? A fair question, don't you think? An honest question. And think about who he was asking the question of. The one that spoke the universe into existence. The one that fearfully and wonderfully made him in his own mother's womb. The one that, uh, let me think, invented love and is love. And I think Jesus looked at Nicodemus. And out of that love, he looked at him and he said, oh, Art thou a master of Israel? And knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, we speak that we do know and testify that we have seen and ye receive not our witness. If I had told you earthly things and ye believe not, how shall I tell you heavenly things? And no man has ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, who is in heaven. And as Moses raised up the serpent in the wilderness... Even so must the Son of Man be raised up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Now here's, I think, what we see. Jesus had just plowed a furrow directly through everything that that guy thought was true. And now he holds in his hand the precious seed, and we watch him let it go. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. Mm, mm, mm. He that believeth on him is not condemned. He that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed on the name of the only begotten Son of God. And here is the condemnation. Jesus, looking deeply at this man, hard at him now, here is the condemnation. Light is 
come into the world. And men love darkness because their deeds are evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds might be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. Seed sowed, right? Nicodemus, thinking deeply. The question is, I wonder what happened to Nicodemus. My name is Jake, and this is my story. So I've been burdened, and I've been talking to my wife about it a lot, and uh, we've been talking to a small group, and uh, that we wanted God to open up doors for us to share the gospel with people on a more of a regular basis, and how we miss everyday opportunities. So I was at Dinosaur Barbecue. My manager happened to be in town for a field ride, and we were sitting there, and I noticed him, he was looking out the window, and right behind us, Dinosaur Barbecue, is the falls and, and the rushing water, and, and he was like, man, could you just imagine falling in there? That would be crazy. And I, I looked back and I was like, ah, oh, yeah, you definitely wouldn't survive that. And I looked at him and I thought, here's an opportunity. I'm going to just go out on a limb. But I brought up the conversation. I said, do you believe in heaven or hell? And he just looked at me as if no one has ever asked him that question before. And he said, you know, I really don't know, but I hope I would go to heaven. For the next two hours, we talked about everything and why I believe what I believe, and what Christ has done in my life. And we sat there, and at the end of it all, he just looked at me and said, no one's ever said this to me before. He, multiple times in conversation, kept saying, man, I guess I never really thought about it, but I, I just don't know. What is, what is my purpose on this earth? Like, what if I am going to die? What about my children? What about my wife? We get done talking, and he, he looks at me and he says, why would you even tell me all this? Like, he, he just couldn't believe that we just spent two hours talking about God. He said, why would you even tell me this stuff? And I said, well, you know what? I love you, and, I, and I, I've grown to appreciate um, the relationship that we have, and, and I would hate to know that I never told you the truth. I said, we have no idea what could happen when we walk out and get in the car, especially with me driving. And you never know what could happen and when our lives could be over. And he just kind of chuckled at me, and he said, you know what? I never even thought about that before. But thanks for telling me. So that night, me and Cheryl had the opportunity to go to dinner with him again. And we bought him a Bible, and we got him an ultimate question book here from church. I gave it to him that night, and he took it home to his hotel, and he read through the entire ultimate question books, and he started reading the Gospel of Matthew. You sit back and you're like, man, how am I, I'm missing opportunities every single day, the people around me, where I see these same people over and over, and most of the time, and most of us see the same people that we work with over and over. Why are we not telling them? I know we've been praying in life group that God would open the door for us to share the gospel with somebody. But was it that he actually opened the door or was it that he actually opened my eyes to see the opportunities around me every day? Although I'm sure it was a risk for me to ask that question to my boss that day at Dinosaur Barbecue, it was well worth it. My name is Jake and I'm a missionary. want to give our young people the opportunity to go to their class right now. We wanted you to stay and uh, watch that testimony. Last week we talked about sowing seed. We went to the parable of the sower and the seed and we use these little tracks that we publish right here at First Bible Baptist Church. We use this as an illustration of sowing seed. And if you were here, remember I kind of, uh, I cast a few of these, maybe 50 years or so cast them out in front of us, just showing how our responsibility is just to sow seed. The message, of course, if you were here, you remember, it was, I spoke of the value of sleep. And the value, the unrealized value of sleep is essentially this, that our responsibility is to sow. It is God's responsibility to bring the increase. 
You can never fail as long as you're willing to sow. Now, admittedly, there are better sowers than others, just like there's better fishermen than others. We started last week with uh, the statement from Aaron from Matthew chapter 4, verse 19, that says that Jesus said to his disciples that he'd make you fishers of men. So we know there are some fishermen who are better fishermen than others. There are some people when they go fishing, they can find fish, and they're going to bring fish in their boat every single time. And then there's people like me. I have learned to love fishing for fishing's sake. Not to catch fish, but I just like to go fishing and because uh, that way I'm never disappointed. So I just sit on the boat and uh, ride around the lake and go for a nice six-hour ride. And then when we come back and we don't have fish, I'm not disappointed. I just like to go fishing. I don't have to catch fish. But there are different kinds of fishermen. There are different kinds of sowers. And uh, some are better than others. And there's, for, there's reasons for that. And you all know that. But let me remind you of this. The only way that you can fail is fail or fa failing by failing to sow the seed. So it is everyone's responsibility to do that. Probably the simplest thing that we all can do in sowing seed is to take a gospel tract and hand it to someone. But the testimonies that we heard this morning, the first testimony from the Bible, Jesus and Nicodemus, and Jake's testimony go beyond just giving someone a piece of gospel literature. We're talking about personal conversations. And that leads me to the title of my message this morning, which is simply this. Why would anybody listen to me? Why would anybody listen to me? You see the, you know, look, that almost looks like Jim Gray up there, doesn't it, a little bit? Maybe when he was uh, 50 years younger than he is now. But uh, why would anybody listen to to you? Or why would anybody listen to me? That's the question this morning that we want to answer. We want to go beyond just taking a piece of gospel literature and passing them out on a street corner to people that we don't know. We may have prayed for them generally, but we don't know their names. We haven't had an opportunity to invest ourselves in them. We've um, never met them before, probably. But yet it's still the right thing to sow the seed. But we will be far more effective by sowing seed in the lives of people that we are already acquainted with or we get to know better than we do. The story of Jesus and Nicodemus is a great story, and it teaches us a number of things. And if you remember, our purpose for our series is to look at the strategies, the personal evangelism strategies of Jesus. And they differ from story to story. In John chapter 3, a man, a very religious man, comes to Jesus Christ and begins to ask him questions. That's one approach. That's one way witnessing opportunities arise in our lives. People come to us for whatever reasons, and they may ask us questions. But in chapter number 4, the next chapter that follows 3, we see Jesus at a well talking to a woman of Samaria. And in that case, Jesus really addressed her, did he not? He was the one that opened the conversation rather than waiting for her to say something to him because the fact of the matter was, culturally, she wouldn't have ever said anything to him. That's the way it was then. Women did not address men. Samaritans did not address Jews. And a woman would not address a teacher, a teacher of the law, whether it was Jew, she was Jewish or Samaritan. So it would have never happened that she would have opened the conversation, practically speaking. So Jesus opened the conversation. If you read that story closely, you'll see in that story that it says that Jesus must needs go through Samaria. Now, I don't know exactly why he had to go there, but I suspect that he had to go there because he had an appointment with this woman to talk to her. So today we're going to go beyond just uh, taking a piece of literature and handing it to someone randomly, and I highly encourage you to do that. And there are ultimate question booklets right here in the front. There are gospel tracts here that you can do that. But let's go beyond 
just randomly passing out the seed or distributing the seed. And let's talk about personal conversation, like Jake spoke of, like is illustrated in John chapter 3, and answer the question, why would anybody listen to me? Or would, why would anybody ever listen to you? Why did Nicodemus go to Jesus and discuss these things? Now, the name Nicodemus means this. Let me give you just a little bit of background information that will help you uh, understand who he was. And Jim already gave us some. The name Nicodemus means simply this, victorious among the people. His name is a combination of two Greek words, victorious among the people. And you know, as you read names in the Bible, they always have some kind of meaning. Uh, Jim asked the question at the end, I wonder whatever happened to Nicodemus. Maybe his name means something to answer the question. Victorious among the people. As you study Nicodemus, you'll see that he shows up in two other passages in the Gospel of John. He shows up in chapter 7, and he's very sympathetic with Christ. He shows up in John chapter 19 at the crucifixion of Christ and becomes part of the party of people that deal with the body of Christ and, and preparing him for burial and all that. And it seems through the Gospel of John, the only book that Nicodemus shows up in, is that uh, uh, Nicodemus is being brought closer and closer and closer to Christ. And maybe his name gives us some indication. Victorious among the people. It may be that he finally came to a place where he trusted Christ as Savior. We live today in what philosophers call a postmodern world. <clears throat> Postmodernism, the philosophy, and that's pretty much the philosophical point of view probably of most people 45 and younger, maybe 50 or younger. Things have changed in my lifetime very much. Modernism, my, uh, philosophically speaking, people had answers. There were absolute answers, etc. But we live in a day today where young people, and I say young, maybe 45 or so and younger, don't believe that there are any absolute answers to anything. They are very relativistic in their thinking, and they are very what they, what they would believe to be, and we might call, tolerant. They believe in equality of all ideas. In other words, everybody can be right. Another word for that is pluralism. So we face an obstacle today that is a daunting obstacle in trying to reach people with the gospel of Christ. My generation believed in absolute truth. We believed in the church. We believed in the Bible. We believed in Christ. When we're speaking from Christianity's perspective, we may not have been saved, but we believed in absolutes. Today, young people don't believe that. All ideas are up for grabs. And when you say you have the answer to all people's questions or the Bible is the answer, young people today may automatically dismiss you from conversing with you any longer. They don't believe that. Now, I'm not saying they're not open to spiritual truth and spiritual reality, but I'm saying this. If you and I come across to young people today and say, this is the only way, I'm right, you are wrong, and that is the way you approach people, they probably won't even listen to you. Although you may be 100% correct, they don't want to deal with people that come across arrogantly and with an attitude of being a know-it-all. In sowing seed, as we've said, the only failure, though, is the failure to sow or the failure to go fish. Last week we looked at Pakistani missionary pastor sowing the seed of God's word. We looked at Aaron's testimony as we looked at Jake's testimony this morning. And then we listened to Jim's dramatic interpretation of, uh, of the gospel of John in John chapter 3. To, today we want to move beyond just giving out tracts. And again, I'm not disparaging that. Please don't misunderstand me. But... In doing that, 
we don't establish relationships generally with people. We're randomly passing out or we're sowing the seed of the Word of God. Our most effective personal evangelism happens when we have a conversation with people. I did not come to Christ as a result of a gospel tract or even as a result of a piece of gospel literature. Some of you have, some of you have not. I came to Christ because someone engaged me in personal conversation. Someone approached me. Someone came to me and asked me a question that I could not answer. There are lots of different scenarios presented in God's Word. but We want to talk about personal conversation. So I want to answer the question this morning, how can, how, how, why would anybody listen to me? Why would anybody listen to me? Or how can I get people to listen to me? You all want to know the answer to that question, don't you? How am I going to get someone to listen to me? <clears throat> the answers to that question are found in the text of John chapter number 3. <clears throat> Why was it that Nicodemus went to Jesus to ask him the questions that he did? At the conclusion of the message last Sunday, I gave you four things that you could do. I said you can prepare yourself, you can pray, you can invest in people, and you can invite people. When we speak about tract evangelism, we can prepare ourselves <clears throat> by praying before we go, but we really don't know the people that we are going to talk to, and we may not have any time to invest or invite them to do anything. So how do we get people to listen? I'm going to have to have some water from somebody. I already drank one. Could, could one of you guys in the back get me some water? I've been dealing with a little bit of a cold or allergies this week, and now my throat just went locked up on me. So, Gary, are you going to do that? Gary's going to do that. Thank you. <clears throat> I drank a whole bottle of water before I started. I had suspicion that this was going to happen to me. A mint? No, I need some water. That's, but thank you very much. But I'll take all of your mints after the service, okay? And anything else you have in your purse. Um, money, particularly, all right? How can I get people to listen to me? Or why would anybody want to listen to you? It's a good question. Ask yourself, why would anybody want to listen to you? If you go up to someone and you begin a conversation, as, uh, as we heard Jake this morning, he was risking, he was risking uh, a potential problem when he opened the conversation with his boss and said, you know, where would you, where would you go? Would you go to heaven or hell? I don't think he knew exactly how his boss would respond. But, listen, he knew him well enough and felt comfortable enough that he wouldn't respond in a totally negative way. That in some way he could say, you know, I really never thought of it, and you know, Jake, I love you, but I'd really rather not talk about it right now. And so that might have been the worst thing that could have happened. Maybe he would have fired him and said, you're fired, I don't want you to be here anymore, I don't want to talk to you. But the conversation with Nicodemus teaches us three very, very important things why people will listen to you. We want to give you some reasons, thank you Gary, why people will listen to you. Now, these are three principles that come right out of the story. And uh, let me explain them to you very quickly. We'll look at them more carefully. Jesus was a person of character. Nicodemus himself said this about Jesus. He said, I know that thou art a man sent from God. He knew that. That was part of the reason that he was willing to engage him. So his reputation or his lifestyle had something to do with that. Now let me warn you right now. Nobody is perfect. So if you're trying to uh, uh, exempt yourself from personal evangelism on the basis that you're not perfect, nobody's perfect. Now, Jesus was perfect. He had perfect character, but I don't and you don't. In fact, if you look at the other things here, compassion and competence, no one is perfectly competent in the Scriptures, and no one is all loving and loves every person to the ultimate degree. 
All of these things are seen relativistically to you and I. We need to be people of character, striving to be people of character. We need to be people of compassion, striving to be more loving and compassionate with people. And we need to be people who are competent or who understand God's Word and are able to uh, explain God's Word and answer people's questions from the Word of God. Now, there's another way that uh, we could look at this. We could call this these three things. Number one could be credibility. Number two could be care or compassion. Number three could be content. That is what we have to say to this individual. Those are some of the different ways of looking at this. Now, this is how we can pre prepare ourselves. There's really only three things we have to remember from this sermon, and I've listed them there, and let me just explain a little bit more. The Greeks, in fact, it was Aristotle who uh, came up with this. In trying to influence and impact people, he studied people, and he came up with what we call, or philosophers call today, the rhetorical triangle. Now, don't get hung up on that, but this isn't a new idea that I'm presenting to you. We're going back 2,500 years to Aristotle, long before Jesus even came to this earth, which, which reminds me to say this, that all truth is God's truth. If Aristotle figured something out that is in the Bible, or if some lost person figures out some truth, it's still true regardless of who believes it. You understand that? Truth doesn't depend upon the believer. Truth is truth if there are no believers. The Bible says, let God be true and every man a liar. So the truth is the truth if no one believes it at all. But the Greek word for character is the word ethos. We get the word ethics from that. An ethical person is a good person. He follows some rules and some regulations. So the first thing that we need to have is we need to have some ethical appeal to people. What does that mean? Your words need to match your lifestyle. In other words, if you're a drunk or a whoremonger, or a prostitute, or a drug addict, or if the neighbors hear you in the summertime screaming and yelling and arguing with your wife because you got the windows open, if you walk across the driveway, you know, within a half hour to talk to them about Jesus, you understand you lose your credibility because of your behavior. You understand that? So all of us need to be concerned about how we behave ourselves. We become credible when our life matches the message of the Word of God. Now, we have to be careful not to be arrogant. We need to be repentant. We need to be hum humble. We don't need to come across as self-righteous. You don't come to a, your neighbor and say, you know, we go to church on Sunday morning, and we believe that you ought to go too. How far do you think you'll get with that kind of approach? When you embarrass someone or you act in a self-righteous or holier-than-thou manner, you may be a perfect, a, a perfect person in your mind. You may have it all together, morally speaking, but your approach is going to turn people off. People are drawn by humility and honesty, by ethics or an ethical appeal. The second thing that attracts people is pathos. There are words like uh, pathetic or pathological. Th those words are from the root word pathos in the Greek, which simply means compassion and care. You've heard the saying, it goes like this, people don't care what you know until they know that you care. You understand that? Let me say that again. People don't care what you know until they know that you care, that you care for them. People don't want to listen to people who are just kind of passing through their life and have no kind of personal relationship or interaction. For those of you who do pass out tracts, you know that that is one of the obstacles. The people don't know you. You have a perfect heart towards God. You love God. You're there trying to sow the seed. But you know one of the disadvantages of just distributing literature without a relationship is the people don't know you, and there's no compulsion for them to, no personal 
or compassionate compulsion or emotional compulsion for them to listen to what you have to say. And by the way, they may have encountered people standing on street corners or in some kind of situation like that, yelling spiritual obscenities at people, telling people, if you don't get saved, you're going to go to hell, you're going to go to hell. And all. I don't think that's the best way to try to get people's attention and engage in a conversation. Now, I said the best way. There may be a time and a place for that, but it's probably pretty rare. People are reached in influence best by loving them, by showing care and compassion to them. I can think of people over the years in this ministry that have been one to Christ just because a group of people or an individual reached out to a lost person who was in need, did something for them, maybe brought some meals to them, visited them in the hospital, babysat their children for them, did something for them in their home while they were disadvantaged, and it opened the door to a relationship to begin to have a conversation with that person. It would have never happened if that individual didn't reach out in an act of kindness and compassion to them. So the first thing is this. Your behavior, your character matters in personal evangelism. Jesus was perfect. When Nicodemus came to him, he said, I know that thou art a man of God. Now, men and ladies... Is that what you're known for in your family, at work, in your neighborhood, even here at First Bible Baptist Church? It's important that we are credible with our personal testimony. <clears throat> I don't know Jake's relationship with his boss, but I believe, based on what I heard in that testimony, is that Jake has behaved himself ethically and honorably in his relationship with his boss. In other words, he's met his boss's rules and expectations for work. He's conducted himself honorably. That has helped open the door to him. Now, how Jake has shown his care and compassion, I'm really not sure, That other than the fact that he tried to reach him with the gospel. But of course, lost people don't appreciate that kind of care and compassion from a Christian. But there's probably things that his boss has seen from him that have has touched him and say, you know, this young man is a little bit different. He actually shows like he cares about somebody other than himself. So then when we're talking about pathos, we're talking about loving people. Remember what our mission statement is? Love God. Anybody remember the second part? <laughs> Let's try that again. Ready? Love God, love people, serve others, and tell everyone. Those four things are inseparably intertwined. You can't love God without loving people. You can't do that. You can't tell me you love people and don't love God. You can't say I love people, but I ain't serving anyone. And as Christian people, we can't say we love God, we love people, but we're not going to tell anyone. They're all inextricably, that's a big word, that means they're like rubber bands all wound around each other. You, can't, you can understand how each of them are different, but practically speaking, you cannot separate the four of those things. They don't just stand alone. They rise and fall as, as a philosophy of ministry. That's why for us to say we love God and never tell anyone, that's hypocritical, people. I know those are strong words, but it's so true, making an appeal to you. It's easy to say, oh, I love God, I love people. Well, do you ever tell anyone? No, but I still love God and love people. Working on the last one. Are you? Well, let's work on it. That's what this series of messages is all about. So we need to be credible. We need to have character. We need uh, the message needs to match the messenger. Do you get that? You understand that? And secondly, we need to show love and compassion to people. We need to, we, we need to show that we care about people other than ourselves. 
Nicodemus in the story knew that Jesus was on a mission. He observed his passion. He understood that Christ actually had to suffer himself personally, persecution and loss for teaching and preaching his message. He sought that. He knew that Jesus was passionate about what he did. So, and again, the fact that Jesus made himself accessible, available to Nicodemus. When Nicodemus approached him and said, I know that they're a, you're a teacher. I know you're a man sent from God. Jesus didn't say, well, you're very observant, but honestly, I don't have time for you. If he would have responded that way, that would have been the end of the conversation. Jesus was accessible. He was available to Nicodemus. And that's what we need to be. We need to love people. We need to be accessible. We need to be available for conversation. Sometimes all you have to do, in fact, I highly recommend this, is say, Lord, lead me to someone today that I can talk to. If you want to talk to someone, do you think the Lord is going to deny you that? Come on. I remember one time, I've told this story, this is the most unusual thing that's ever happened to me in witnessing. I remember I was sweeping out my garage. It was summertime in both days, and it was, I was sweeping out my garage, and uh, I was thinking, you know, I've got to talk to my next-door neighbor. How am I going to open a conversation with him? And I'm cleaning the garage, and I'm going back and forth, and I'm really caught up in this and trying to devise a plan, and I looked up, and my neighbor's walking up the driveway. He's walking up the drive. I go, uh-oh, here we go. He walks up to me, and this is what he said to me. He said, what do Baptists believe? <laughs> now, the door was still not open, and I continued, no, no. You talk about, it's like, God, this is, a, I mean, this is, you're really listening to me praying here today. He came over to my house and asked me, so I had the opportunity right there to say, this is what the Bible teaches. We believe the Bible, and I went through a witnessing opportunity with him. I asked God for the opportunity. Do you want to talk to people? Do you want to be a witness? Do you want to be a fisher of men? Do you want to be a sower? The only failure is failing to sow, people. I don't want to die. I don't want to go to the judgment seat of Christ and be a failure failing to sow. Love God Love people, serve others, and tell everyone. Now, I know this is going to take a while to really penetrate and sink in for us because churches don't tell everyone. Churches just don't do that today. I don't know if we're spoiled. I don't know if we're lazy. I don't know if we think that somebody else should do it. There's all kinds of reasons why we don't do what we're supposed to do. But we have to stop making excuses and say, this is my responsibility. I am to be a fisher of men. I am to be willing to tell everyone, and I need to learn better how to do that. And you must be a person of character. You must be credible. The message needs to match the messenger. It's so important. And secondly, you have to love people. There has to be an emotional appeal by investing yourself in other people. Maybe your neighbor goes on vacation and you say, hey, listen, I'll cut your grass while you're gone. I'll watch your house. I'll make sure the garbage is taken care of. Is there anything else I can do while you're away? We need to find ways to interact, to connect with people, and then invest ourselves in them. If the, if the first thing that you do to someone you've never met before is, you want to come to church with me? They probably will say no. You may find a few people that would say yes, but most people, they don't know you, they don't trust you, they don't know who you are, they don't know what they're getting into, and they're probably to protect themselves. Not because they hate you, but they're probably going to say, no, I, I really need to think about doing something like that. But once they know that you're a man or a woman of honor, of character, 
the message matches that kind of a message, and you have invested yourself in people, then they're much more open to an invitation. Much more open to an invitation. In fact, you'd be surprised. People that you think wouldn't ever respond positively, they would. Now, I didn't say everybody, but people that you have already drawn a line through their name and said they'll never get saved, those are some of the people that will respond and positively come. And they'll shock you. It's not up to me, remember the parable last week, to decide where the seed gets sown. In the parable, the sower sowed it everywhere, everywhere. There's more than enough seed to sow. We'll never run out of seed. And it's not wasteful sowing everywhere because we never know where the seed will take root. We never know. So what do we have to be? We have to be people of character. We have to be people of compassion, people who love people and prove that by investing ourselves as Jesus. He made himself accessible to others and he made himself accessible to this man called Nicodemus. And here's the third thing. This is important also. The third thing, the third thing that Aristotle recognized that, that helped people be influential with other people was the word logos. You've heard that before. We get our word logical from logos. The word means the word. That's what logos means. And we're talking about being competent with the scriptures. And let me go back to something I said before, because this is a place where some of us excuse ourselves. We say, you know, I really don't know the Bible that well, and if I open a conversation, I'm going to look like an idiot. Uh, that may be true. That may be true. But that shouldn't keep you from doing the best you can. No one has all of the answers. No one has all the answers when it comes to evangelism. People have asked me questions, hundreds of questions over the years. I've said, you know, I don't know the answer, but I'll get back to you. And I resolved a long time ago, if somebody asks me a question that I don't know, I'm going to learn the answer, and I'll never get caught like that ever again. I'll get the answer, and the next time somebody asks me that question, I'll be prepared for it. That's growing in the grace, that's the love part, and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So the third thing is, we need to know God's Word. People, people, let me make an appeal, and I don't, I don't mean this to be arrogant. There isn't a church within 50 miles that spends more time teaching the Bible than First Bible Baptist Church. There isn't a church. If there is, they're doing a great job, and I just don't know about it. I'm not bragging, I'm just simply saying you have all kinds of opportunities to learn the Word of God. But even if you didn't attend a church like this, there's no excuse for you not knowing the Word of God. It's your responsibility to learn. It's your responsibility to learn. So our tendency is we're fearful. I'm not going to talk because I'll be found out a fool and I don't know what I'm talking about. So the third reason why somebody might listen to you is you know what you're talking about. You under, you're competent. You can handle the questions to some degree. This is what we call, or what the Greeks called, the reasonable appeal. Your explanations from the Word of God are reasonable. It makes sense what you're talking about. And that's our responsibility to learn how to do that. I need to be more competent. I need to have more content in my witness. Just declaring the Romans road. It's a great start. John 3, 10 and 23, excuse me, Romans 3, 10 and 23, and Romans 6, and Romans 5, and Romans chapter 10. And then having a general understanding of all the material in between, that's a great place. But people are going to begin asking questions outside of Romans chapter 3 to Romans chapter 10. You're going to have to know more than that. Fifty years ago, the general population went to church. Many did. They understood Christian doctrine in principle because they got it in public education. 
They got it in. More people went to church. So there was a better general understanding of Christianity. You're living in a culture today that is not friendly to Christianity. They don't get it positively through the media. They don't get, they don't get it in public education. Many don't get it at home because only 20% or less in the population even attend church on a regular basis. So our children are growing up knowing nothing about God's Word. So you just don't warash in there with four verses of Scripture and convert someone to Christianity. I believed, when I, before I was ever witnessed to, I believed the Bible was the Word of God. I believed Jesus Christ was the Son of God, that He was divine, God in flesh. I believed that He was born of a virgin. I believed that He literally, physically resurrected. I believed that He uh, uh, was coming again. And I, could, I believed in the Trinity. I believed all that stuff. And I wasn't saved. I wasn't saved. You say, how could you believe all that stuff and not be saved? Because I believed I had to work my own salvation out myself. I believe I had to save myself. But here's my point. My point is this. It took six weeks for me to come to Christ as Savior. And I believed all that. Think of the people that we're dealing with today that don't even know what I'm talking about right now. Maybe they have a negative impression of the Bible. They think the Bible is a bunch of fairy tales and fables. They think that it's homophobic or whatever. And they don't. Even, you think you're just going to win them to Christ in five minutes with four verses of Scripture? You and I need to know what we're talking about. We need to know what we're talking about. And by the way, lost people know less today than they have in the last hundred years. So if you know anything about the Bible, if you can quote John 3.16, they might think you're a Bible scholar. They go, wow, you really take the Bible seriously. You know one verse of Scripture. They don't know anything. They're blanks. They're theological blanks. But it's our responsibility to sow, to sow. We need to know what we are talking about. My character, the type of person I am, the message and messenger ought to match up. I need to love people. I need to invest myself in people. That's what Jesus did. He left heaven to invest himself in people. And let me tell you, he knew what he was talking about. He always knew what he was talking about. Here, is a religious leader, a Pharisee, the most conservative of the Jews, a member of the Sanhedrin, the elders of Jerusalem, and he doesn't get it theologically. And Jesus has to instruct him on his, the Old Testament law that he's supposed to be a master of himself. Jesus knew what he was talking about. So, what can we do? What can we do? That was the question that I ended our uh, message last week with. This was the first thing on the top of the list, and I didn't explain this. I'm explaining it today. Prepare yourself. Prepare yourself. Your character brings credibility. Your compassion shows that you truly care, and your words show that you know what you're talking about. You know what you're talking about. That's, according to Aristotle, and according to George, and we're kind of along the same lines, Aristotle and George say this is what gets people, the interest of people. And this is exactly what Jesus is doing in John chapter 3. He knows what he's talking about. He loves the soul of Nicodemus and he is a man sent from God and recognized to be so and he comes to Jesus and he begins to ask him questions if you're that type of person people will come to you and begin to ask questions from you first Peter says but sanctify 
the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. We're supposed to be prepared. We're supposed to know what we're talking about, the Bible says. And we are to prepare ourselves. Prepare ourselves, what I just said, and then we need to pray for people. Pray for your family. Maybe you've had a disagreement and you got upset with them, they with you. Don't write them off. Pray for them. Love them. Invest yourself in them. Build a relationship with them. Sacrifice or suffer for them. Give them a piece of yourself to show that you care for them. And then invite them. Invite them. Invite them to take a Bible. Invite them to merge. Invite them to church. Invite them to Jesus, to Jesus Christ. Invite them to him, to Jesus Christ. Why would anyone listen to you? Why would anyone listen to me? You ever thought about that? Maybe you've asked that question and said, no one will. Well, I'll tell you how you'll get a hearing. Be a man or a woman of God. Love people and know what you're talking about from God's word. Go to school, people. Your education is not over. Just because you graduated from high school or college or you have a postgraduate degree, our education is not over. We need to know more and more and more so we can be prepared to answer the questions of people. And again, don't disqualify yourself on the basis of not being perfect, not being all-loving, and not being all-knowing. Don't do that. Strive to be better in each of those areas. Maybe some other words for these are we need to be men and women of integrity, we need to love, and we need to be knowledgeable. I thought this morning if I wanted to add something to that, knowledge and wisdom. Knowledge slash wisdom. Wisdom comes from the Word of God. Now, my friend, you have a bulletin this morning? You picked one up when you came in, or hopefully it is our goal to put one of these in every person's hands. First of all, those of you who are here, is there anyone who is not here right now? Okay. That, that way, we do, there's no exceptions to what I just said. All of those of you who are here today, I want you, if you have a bulletin, fill out your communication card. Let's try to get 100% participation here. On the inside of your communication card, on the inside or other side, it says this. My next step today, it's right towards the cop, top of the card, it says, my next step today is to, see the little box? Honestly, ask myself this question. Why would anyone listen to me? And list three reasons. I gave you three reasons why anyone would listen. Write it down on there. And then the second question, or the second box is, pray and tell God that I want to make a difference in someone else's life. The only way you can do that is to have influence. And the only way you can have influence is to be a man or woman of character, to be a man or woman who loves people, and to be a man or woman who knows what he or she is talking about. Pray that you will make a difference in someone else's life. Now the invitation is this. Fill out your communication card. I want you to look at the question there. I want you to evaluate that. I am going to pray, and then I'm going to invite you. If you want to come and pray about one of these three or all three of these principles that we all need to prepare ourselves with, if you want to come and get a gospel track or an ultimate question booklet, I have several of them here. Come and get one and pray about the person that you are going to give that to and you're going to make a difference in that person's life. Join me in a word of prayer. Would you do that right now? Now, Father, thank you for our Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and what a wonderful example 
he is to each and every one of us. Father, we have a responsibility. There's no plan B for evangelism. You've given us the responsibility to be fishers of men. Help us to accept that responsibility, to take it seriously, and to prepare ourselves, prepare ourselves to be men and women of character, men and women of compassion, and men and women who know what they're talking about. Know your word, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together, everyone. Would you do that? Stand together. Now let's respond to the invitation. Let's fill out our communication card. You'll have a chance to give that to the ushers as you leave. I want you to look at those two boxes. I want you to pray about that. You can come here to pray about that at the altar before you check that box or after you do. There are tracks right here at the front of the auditorium. Listen, let me tell you, sometimes you come to church and you say, you know, I'm not sure I agree with what the pastor said. I want you to know this. I told you the absolute truth this morning. And if you reject what is said, directed to you as God's people, you are rejecting the truth of God's word for your life. Let's not do that. If you love me, Jesus said, keep my commandments. Let's respond to the Holy Spirit in the invitation. David is going to lead us. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. My chains are gone. My chains are gone. I've been set free. My God, my Savior has ransomed me. Unlike a flood, His mercy reigns. Unending love, amazing grace. be discouraged by people who won't listen or won't, won't respond. It isn't my job to bring the increase. By the way, your leader, our example, was despised and rejected. They crucified him because of his message. That's part of the Christian life. Pick up your cross daily and stop being a little baby, whining over the fact that people don't want to listen to me. Or, you know, the whole world's going to hell. No one will listen anymore. That, first of all, that isn't true. There are people that will listen, but it's my responsibility to sow. If no one will listen, it's my responsibility. Men, be men. Man up. Well, you know, I want somebody to say that. Shut up. Stop whining. Man up. No one's going to hurt you. No one's going to strap you to a pillar and whip you and beat you. Not this week anyway, maybe next week. But no one's going to do that because you're bringing Christ to them. Man up. Ladies, ladies are much more relational than men. 
you have as many or more opportunities than men do because you like relationships. Men do not go to the bathroom together. Women do. For women, going to the bathroom is a social event. It's not for men. Women are better at relating to, uh, to women. You have many more opportunities just because you're more wonderful than we are. That's all. Woman up. Stop whining and moaning and complaining. Let's be the church people. Let's be God's people. Go ahead and be seated. The things you learn in church. <laughs> the things you can't repeat after church is done. So many things. If you're a visitor and this is your first time, on behalf of the church, I'm sorry. <laughs> but here's the thing. Um, we're very happy that you came in spite of everything that just happened. Uh, and when you leave, we want to let you know that we have a gift for you. There's a little welcome center right out in the back of the commons. We'd ask you to just make your way out, pick up your gift. There's a little coupon in there for a free cup of coffee in the cafe. I can also tell you this, that um, Pastor George Grace, he hangs out in the commons, and he would love uh, to shake your hand and uh, get to know you just a little bit. I want to let you know that Compass Care still needs your help in raising funds to service women at risk for abortion in the Rochester area in the Walk for Life, which is Saturday, May 4th at 9 a.m. Um, again, Compass Care, boy, is one of the most tangible ministries where you can see the work of God on display. And truly, uh, if you're not participating in any ministry at all, uh, this would be a great place, perhaps, to think about plugging in. Also, I want to let you know, next Sunday, David Gibbs who is uh, the, I guess, I'm not quite sure, he's the CEO and founder, this might be his son, Andy? No, it's, it's the main guy, founder uh, and CEO of the Christian Law Association. This is an association, it's a national organization. They provide free legal services for churches that, uh, who've had their liberties attacked by some outside group. And um, I'm going to guess that his message will kind of bring us up to date on the state of our spiritual liberties here in this country, so I think it's a, an important service, and I hope that you won't miss it. All right, why don't you stand with me, let's pray, and we'll be dismissed. Lord, thank you for everything. Thank you for this place. Thank you for the truth that we hear every single Sunday. Lord, would you help us to sow your seed, Lord, with enthusiasm, with sobriety, Lord, and with deep, deep commitment. In Jesus' name, amen. You are dismissed.